Now, Colorado accuses the president's Supreme Court pick of sexual misconduct. Taxpayers will be responsible for most of a major settlement by a school district accused of covering up abuse. A candidate for Congress mistakes one minority group for another. There may or may not have been a near riot at the Denver jail, depending on who you believe. And Coloradans just can't stop leaving guns in unlocked cars. Guess who's figured that out? Please stop this Monday. We'd like to get off. Next. A Coloradan is now known worldwide after stepping into the spotlight with another sexual misconduct claim against Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh. The media descended on the home of Debbie Ramirez, reached out to those who know her from her years in Boulder. Here's Marshall Zellinger. Boulder is beautiful, but today it felt a little funny because of why we were here. You see, Boulder resident Debbie Ramirez was a private person until about 24 hours ago when the New Yorker published her claims of sexual misconduct against Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh. On her street, there were cars and SUVs with local and national journalists. My photographer and I were briefly among them. Why? Because sometimes you just never know. This time, we found a recycling bin with a friendly note. I have no comment. Thank you for respecting my privacy. While Ramirez was not adding to her story, others were. She's a board member for the organization that used to be called Boulder Safe House. It's now SPAN, Safe House Progressive Alliance for Nonviolence. Her fellow board members and the staff there posted online, it is never simple or easy for survivors to share their experiences. To do so in the face of public scrutiny requires a level of strength that is true to the person Debbie is. Beyond her role as a board member, Ramirez used to work at SPAN. She was in charge of a 24-7 crisis team that responded to domestic violence and sexual assault calls. Now, Ramirez works for Boulder County, a volunteer coordinator at the Housing and Human Services Office in North Boulder. She's been there since early 2013, helping low-income families access money for food, bills, and child care. That's a lot of public information for you to know about someone who, 24 hours ago, was just another private citizen. For next, I'm Marshall Zellinger in Boulder. Now here is something that we do know. Colorado's Democratic Senator Michael Bennett, his office, had a heads up before this latest allegation went public. His spokeswoman says they were tipped off by the Judiciary Committee staff and that it was Bennett's office that pointed Ramirez to her initial attorney, a prominent Democrat, former Boulder County District Attorney Stan Garnett. As of today, Senator Bennett is calling for a delay in the nomination and an FBI investigation. Now, Bennett was a no vote on Kavanaugh long before these allegations. Colorado's Republican Senator Cory Gardner has always been expected to be a yes, and that is why protesters were outside his office today. Gardner was traveling back to D.C. at the time. We asked to speak with him here. We were told he was too busy. His office says that Gardner, quote, absolutely supports efforts by the Senate Judiciary Committee to gather more information and investigate these claims. Unlike Bennett, Gardner's office says he did not know about these new allegations before they were in the news. Debbie Ramirez was immediately smeared today as having taken money from the liberal billionaire George Soros. And then it came out that Soros Fellowship actually went to an entirely different Deborah Ramirez. The false claim was walked back by the conservative National Review as well as the conservative blog Colorado Peak Politics. It's certainly clear there is a price paid by those who come forward with allegations of sexual misconduct. And in a moment, our Chris Vanderveen offers his thoughts on the far-reaching impact of that reality. The Democratic challenger in Colorado's increasingly diverse 6th Congressional District is apologizing for mistaking one minority group for another. Jason Crow's spokesman says that they met with Hindu and Sikh groups on Saturday. The campaign then tweeted a photo of Crow's meeting with the Sikhs, but labeled them as Hindus. The error was caught by Aurora Sentinel letter Dave Perry. The Crow campaign fixed the error, said they're running on restoring accountability and they will be accountable for their mistakes. Taxpayers in the Cherry Creek School District will be on the hook for the bulk of a massive settlement, an $11.5 million payout to the families of five girls who were sexually abused by a former teacher. School leaders face criminal charges for not reporting abuse allegations. Jeremy Hohola is from our investigative team. He's here to offer some perspective on this enormous settlement. Yeah, it's a lot of money, Kyle. Cherry Creek runs on tax dollars from you and me when we pay federal, state taxes and property taxes. This is indeed the largest settlement payout in the school district's history, 11.5 million. Taxpayers will cover 9.5 million of that. The remaining 2 million will be covered by an insurance company.
for the school district. Meanwhile, the former teacher at the center of all of this, Brian Vasquez, already pleaded guilty to sex crimes involving five students. The grooming, the sexual abuse happened while he was a teacher at Prairie Middle School with the first victim in 2013. He is expected to be sentenced this Friday and he could face 40 years to life. Two other school administrators are also facing charges in connection to this horrible case. The principal and the dean at the school are accused of not reporting the abuse properly to law enforcement when one of the girls came forward. They've been paid on paid leave for nearly a year now as their cases make their way through the justice system. The attorney representing the five girls in this case has this to say about how the victims are doing today. Two of the clients are really focused on um, themselves, on their mental health, on preparing themselves to hopefully be in a place where they can return to school. And uh, the others are, uh, one is still in high school and we expect her to graduate and two are attending college. The school district says this settlement money came from a reserve account. In an email sent to parents, the district said it trained its 9,000 employees and has strengthened its mandatory reporting requirement. And by my math, Kyle, if my math is correct, mm -hmm. the school district could have hired about 130 teachers for one year in the district with the money it has to spend on the settlement. All, all afternoon, we've been trying to find perspective yeah. for people on whether there have been larger settlements. Yeah. Uh, I don't recall one in my 11 years here called the Colorado School Boards Association. They didn't have any hard numbers on this. They sent me to the insurance company for these schools. Yeah. They didn't have anything right away. It's certainly a large number for that district. And oh. I think if we look back in our archives, it'll probably be reflective that this is probably a very, very large record settlement for all school districts in Colorado. All right, Jeremy, thank you yeah. very much. Here's the deal. Somebody is not telling the truth about what went down at the Denver jail last Friday. The sheriff's union says it was a near riot. Sheriff's office says not even close. It claims that two uncooperative inmates were brought under control in less than a minute. The Fraternal Order of Police said on Twitter that the near riot, their term, involved inmates fighting and then many more inmates turning on the responding deputies on Friday evening. The FOP, the union, says more officers responded and, quote, the uprising was quelled at that point. They used the hashtag only a matter of time. Now, if you watch this program, you know the Sheriff's Union is constantly at odds with Mayor Michael Hancock and his public safety team. And in this case, the Sheriff's Office, the management, disputes the union's near riot claim. They say this is just two inmates brought back under control within a minute. They told us late this evening there was one officer who was injured. The Sheriff's Office does acknowledge that that detention center is overcrowded and the temporary beds have been brought in to house inmates. The union says that is driving the safety issue. Johnstown police officer Yuri Thomas is being remembered as a man with a heart for his community. Friends, family, and fellow officers gathered today in memory of that officer who died this month swimming at Horsetooth Reservoir. They came together at Res Church in Loveland, where Thomas was a familiar face, a man known for his work ethic, his enthusiasm, and his contagious friendliness that literally brought people in the door. He had the perfect role. He was a greeter at this front door right here, and he would greet people with a huge smile, and he'd reach out and grab their hand and pull them in, basically. So I know we're going to miss him so much, and so are the people that attend here. Officer Thomas had been with the Johnstown Police Department a short time, just since February. Returning now to our discussion about how America is reacting to allegations of sexual misconduct by Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh. Our Chris Vanderveen offers these thoughts on the decision that some in our community might make to stay silent. She's watching this, watching all of it, the attention, the reaction, and the ramification of speaking up, speaking out, moving forward. She's watching and wondering, what might happen to her? Should she speak up? Should she speak out? Maybe you believe what's happening to him is unfair. Maybe you believe he deserves it. At this moment, I really don't care what you think. Not that I don't care what's happening to him, I do. But I also know in a few days, he'll once again have his chance to be heard. He'll find his voice, tell his story, send his message. No, at this moment, I care more about the teen who was raped this last weekend. Maybe by a friend, maybe not. She's watching this, all of this, 
and struggling to find her voice, tell her story, send her message. Far too many victims never come forward. Far too many remain silent, resigning themselves to a world far too skeptical to listen and understand and believe. Inside this circus, I worry what the victims far outside of the tent see, the scrutiny, the questions, the doubt. Does it bother them? Does it make them conclude, why bother? I hope not, because each deserves not just a say, each deserves their day, their day to come forward and tell the world what happened was not okay. And not just not okay, but a crime. Somewhere out there, a victim is watching closely, wondering if it's worth it. Somehow within this circus, we need to remind her, you have a voice, you have strength, and you deserve so much more than a world far too ready to say, are you sure? Are you sure this really happened to you? You know you're not supposed to leave valuables in your car. You do know that's more than just your phone and wallet, right? Should go without saying, perhaps, but probably shouldn't leave that gun in your car either. You could end up like the 22 gun owners in Denver in just the last month who had their guns snatched by thieves. Noel Brennan has the lesson you wouldn't think anybody would need. Today, it's simulated and broken down into storyboards. But Denver police say this is happening for real and happening far too often. We have too many incidences where people are leaving weapons in their car, guns, and then having those cars broken into. Guns in the hands of criminals is very dangerous for our city and we need the public's help. From January 1st to August 31st of this year, DPD says 112 guns were stolen from cars. That's a 211% increase since 2010. So we've seen sort of a, a surge in this type of crime recently, and then obviously we can track um, the instances of the use of these guns that have been stolen to, to a number of violent crimes. Take this story from March of this year. A gun stolen from a car was used in a robbery fired illegally twice and then recovered in a burglary. It's a very serious issue that impacts the overall safety of our community. Many of the guns used in these violent crimes, police say, are never even found. I think about 10% of the guns that have been stolen have been recovered. The takeaway? Don't leave a gun in your car. For next, I'm Noel Brennan. Here's another number to consider, 5,800. That is the number of car break-ins reported in Denver so far this year. So if you'd like it to be there in the morning, take it out of your car. Happy Monday, everyone. We're looking pretty good here in downtown Denver. Nice to see some cooler temperatures this afternoon, and it's slowly but surely going to start feeling a little bit more like fall. We do have some darker skies pushing off across the eastern plains. A couple of little sprinkles here in the metro area earlier this afternoon, and snowfall up in the high country just a little bit. On Age Street Alpha 9, we've been watching these storms cruising in from the west, zipping off to the east right now. Good batch of some lightning, thunder showers rolling into parts of Nebraska, and then across the eastern plains, too. Still looking pretty quiet here in Denver. One cold front moving through early this morning. The second one rolls in early tomorrow morning. That will really knock down temperatures tremendously. But you'll notice the showers, they'll be few and far between. Early tomorrow morning across the far northeastern plains. Otherwise, it stays fairly dry here around the front range with maybe a few clouds and isolated shower in south central Colorado. Daytime highs, though, cooling off into the mid 60s for us tomorrow. 60s, low 70s off to the plains with 50s and 60s in the high country. Yeah, you get one day. And then finally, some warmer temperatures return. We'll be back into the 80s Friday, Kyle, and into next weekend. Thank you, Danielle. The most Colorado thing we saw today comes to us from next viewers Don and Melanie Kirk. Told us they were hiking Friday in Rocky Mountain National Park when they witnessed what appeared to them to be a wonderful act of kindness. 
Some walking sticks left behind at the Copeland Falls trailhead so that others might use them. The falls are special to the Kirks because they got married there about three and a half years ago. People thinking of others. We return in a moment with the story of a Coloradan who remembers the days she could create something beautiful and a whole lot of it. We know how some next viewers spent their weekend. They're just out snapping photos to tell people you've crossed the line. To Petco in Aurora we go, where Faith Alton found what could be a record for this segment, an SUV that takes up not one, not two, but three parking spaces. See how everybody else is doing it right and one person feels entitled? Bigger the vehicle, bigger the fail, we found. A polite reminder that our state would have more parking if we would all limit ourselves to just one spot. Keep the photos coming. Email next at 9 newscom or get our attention with the hashtag HeyNext. One of our viewers, Terry Baker, would like you to meet the woman she calls Aunt Ruthie. Aunt Ruthie has a talent that dates back to her time in Germany during World War II. Ruthie and others were forced into shelters during air raids. They had to find some way to take the war off their minds. Our Byron Reed shows us how she did it. Let me see. A picture is worth a thousand words for Ruth Wilhelm. I've got a million of them. And when she looks at these moments, they'll always remind her of the past. Well, I was in first grade when the war broke out. I remember coming home and my grandmother lying on the table like this. Wilhelm was living in Castle, Germany during World War II. Yeah, I did the drawing. Spending her days and nights underground. Between the bombs from the sky and the artillery, you know, we stayed down below. We didn't think about it. It was a day-to-day -day thing. The war was on and we went to school and came home and went to the air raid shelters. So to pass the time. Idle fingers of the devil's workshop. You know. She took up an old German art form. Scissor cut is, it's a black piece of paper. And I draw on the back and then I cut that out. Wilhelm says she and other children started making these scenes around Christmas. Cuticle scissors, that's what I used. To try to bring a little joy in desperate times. That kept us busy. We would make these cutouts and uh, put uh, paper behind them and stand them up with a candle be behind them. That's an original. Now 86, Wilhelm kept up with the tradition as long as she could. Let them go and fly to the hands of God. She wants to make sure we all remember just how valuable memories are. And I hope they enjoy them and maybe wonder a little bit. For next. I'm amazed myself. How did I do that? I'm Byron Reed. Ruthie's eyesight forced her to quit her hobby a few years back. At that point, though, she'd stocked up enough cards. She's still giving them to family and friends. I missed your feedback while I was gone. Specifically, I missed hearing daily just how wrong I am. I've got a little stack, and we'll read some of this when we get back. Diane and Renita say we got it wrong, that six should be pronounced Sikhs, not six. We looked this up, the Secretary General of the World Sick Council says that is the preferred pronunciation. M. Burt says, would you have run a piece on Debbie Ramirez's claims? I'll be honest, it's difficult because that New Yorker piece relied on some anonymous sourcing outside of Ms. Ramirez without knowing how, who those people are, how they were vetted. I can't say what we would have done. And Suzanne says, I experienced sexual abuse at a young age and tried to get those in charge to listen. The are you sure questions and the you must be mistaken comments about destroyed me. Glad you were still with us, Suzanne. See you next time.